1812, the United States of America, a fast rising power of 8 million, declares war on Britain and prepares to invade our colony. With the British Empire entrenched in a European war, we must fight for our homeland on our own. Fearless, ingenious, and for the first time, united. The War of 1812 is Canada's War of Independence. We are explorers, risk-takers, and dreamers, fighting the odds in a land of extremes. Across a vast continent, we build a nation. Truly strong and free. August 5th, 1812. While thousands of American troops amass near the border of Upper Canada, 25 kilometers south of what is now Windsor, Ontario, a warrior plans an ambush. Chief Tecumseh of the Shawnee Nation. Tecumseh has been fighting the Americans for 20 years as they tear through his ancestral homelands. American settlement was insatiable. It was not going to stop. And so Tecumseh understood that there was no compromise with the Americans on these things. Tecumseh has marshaled 13 diverse indigenous nations to confront the American onslaught. Our lives are in the hands of the Great Spirit. We are determined to defend our lands. And if it's his will, we wish to leave our bones upon them. Tecumseh was forward-looking. He could lead people because they believed in the vision. He was brilliant in, in bringing the people together. Today, I think they would be called freedom fighters. They would be the ones defending their homelands. As the American troops flee, they leave behind critical intelligence, direct from their most important stronghold. Fort Detroit, on the American side of the Detroit River, protected by seven meter walls, 39 heavy cannons, and a garrison for 2,500 American troops, now preparing to invade Upper Canada. Their commander, General William Hull, a 59-year-old veteran of the American Revolution. Enter. Do the dispatchers get through? They have been intercepted, sir. The documents recovered from American troops are a strategic coup, and Tecumseh knows exactly how to use them. The British have been wavering on informal pledges to protect indigenous lands. Tecumseh wants to make a deal, military intelligence in exchange for Britain's firm support. Everything that he counted on prior to 1811 is gone. What he's doing is trying to maneuver with what's left. The only way he can do this is with British supplies he had no choice but to go to the British in order to defeat the Americans. Tecumseh embarks on an historic meeting with Upper Canada's Major General, Isaac Brock. Obviously, Brock sized up Tecumseh, and Tecumseh sized up Brock. 
and they were impressed with each other and therefore they had trust and confidence in each other, which is really, really important. They dissect the letter from General Hall. I have every reason to expect in a very short time a large body of savages will be directed against this army. You must be sensible of the difficulties which will attend my situation. Hull's extraordinary letter betrays a key weakness, his neurotic fear of indigenous people. It was perfect. I mean, you know, if it had been designed by Sigmund Freud, it couldn't have been any better. It laid out his midnight terrors. It laid out his fears. And you know, all you had to do was devise something that would answer that. Tecumseh offers the help of hundreds of his warriors in exchange for Britain's support for a sovereign indigenous homeland west of the Appalachian Mountains. What was at stake for Tecumseh? Huge territory, the well-being of his people and many nations that had joined together. He thought it was a smart alliance to make. Brock and Tecumseh agree on an audacious plan. First, Brock writes a letter to General Hull. You must be aware that the numerous body of Indians which have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond my control the moment the contest commences. Brock's threat plays straight into Hull's greatest fears. Brock was a brilliant leader, and he had imagination. Being a good soldier is often very unimaginative. Brock was imaginative. Now, it's Tecumseh's time to strike. August 15th, 1812. Bolstered by warriors from the Delaware, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi nations, Tecumseh leads 600 men across the Detroit River towards the American fort, where Brock and his 800 troops will join them. Tecumseh lands on the shores south of Fort Detroit and sizes up the battlefield. Outnumbered two to one, Tecumseh's plan depends on a clever ruse. To the west. Like a magician staging an illusion, Tecumseh orders his men to sweep through the woods in one direction and then back, again and again, choreographing a formation that makes the hundreds at his command look like a cast of thousands. Hull sees a massive fighting force of fierce warriors. His worst nightmare, right before his eyes. That is a genius, genius move. Knowing your enemy, using fear as a tactic. Fear is, is a tool for a commander. It's a tactic, it's part of psychological warfare. You want the enemy to look at you and, and think, oh my God. They're unpredictable. I don't know what they're going to do. They could be over here one moment, behind me another. Sir, your orders? General, sir. Brock joins Tecumseh to await the American general's response. Hull's next move is an act that will lead to his court-martial. He surrenders. Brock and Tecumseh have secured Canada's first major victory against the United States. It's widely thought that the defense policy of Canada up until about 1820 was that it couldn't be defended without the indigenous people. It's a very imperfect history, but it's filled with these surprising relationships. Right, action, 
shoulder. Tecumseh's role in the victory strengthens his alliance with the British. Without him and without his men and without his incredible sense of military reasoning, the British would have been done for. If there's a country called Canada, it's because of Tecumseh and what he did. But 14 months later, the proud Shawnee leader dies in battle. Brock II is killed defending Upper Canada. His promise to support a sovereign indigenous homeland never fulfilled. The British forgot about the deal with Tecumseh and everybody else and really gave away control of the lands. The humiliating defeat at Fort Detroit enrages the U.S. military. Over the next eight months, the U.S. lashes out in a series of fierce attacks along the Canadian border. But the real prize sits on the north shore of Lake Ontario. After a long winter, the ice finally clears on the Great Lake. On April 27, 1813, the Americans launch 14 warships in a major naval offensive. Their target is one of Canada's most important military bases, the garrison of Fort York. Fort York defends Upper Canada's capital, what is now Toronto. Inside the fort's armory, a massive stockpile of deadly munitions. So ammunitions, black powder at the time, anything that they would be able to get their hands on would be the lifeline of the fight. It's a war-winning asset. If the Americans take the armory, they'll own the explosive equivalent of 14 Tomahawk cruise missiles. And by noon, they've already reached the gates. April 27, 1813. 2,000 American soldiers assault the Western Wall of Fort York. One of its defenders, 58-year-old Captain Tito Lelièvre, a veteran of the French Navy, now fighting for the British. Lelièvre has seen enough war to know that his men outnumbered three to one, don't stand a chance. When you're outnumbered in the battle, I mean, suddenly you're gonna feel very, very alone. The feeling would be an ominous dread of what's about to transpire. If it's an equal fight, you've got a chance. But if you look at that hill and there's a lot more of them than there is of you. Take aim! They see what's coming. The soldiers can count. Americans breach the fort's defenses at the West Wall. Lelièvre and his men retreat. A retreat is one of the most difficult operations of war to execute. And if you get it wrong, the enemy is going to take you. Losses are mounting. Surrender seems inevitable. The Americans close in on their target. Fort York's huge stockpile of cannons, mortars, and explosive black powder. Then, Lelièvre receives an order. He must stop the American forces at any cost. With time running out, Lelièvre knows there's only one thing he can do. He knew that probably he would never come back. It's an empowering moment where you realize that, okay, I'm gonna be the one doing it. I'm, I'm gonna do it right, and I won't, I, won't, I won't fail you. The fort is lost, 
But the battle isn't over. He's given a chance to his fellow soldiers. He's given a chance to his leaders. He's given a chance to the nation to survive. A lifelong soldier, a loving husband and father. This is Liliev's defining moment. What's interesting about courage is that it is the most important of all virtues because it's the one that underpins all others. You don't have anything else unless you have courage. sets a fuse and ignites a blast, felt almost 50 kilometers away on the Niagara Peninsula. People are watching this and thinking, what difference can I make? I'm one person. What difference can I make in this country? Tito was one dude. He made an incredible difference. The explosion instantly kills 38 American troops including their high-ranking general. 40 of Liliev's fellow soldiers are caught in the blast. Yes, people, people died in that explosion. But then you wonder how many more people would have died had the American troops gotten their hands on, on those munitions. Well, that's leadership. You gotta live with that. Liliev survives. The American casualties are five times greater than the British. The Americans retaliate, unleashing their revenge on the people of York. For six days, the Americans loot homes and York's library. They destroy the sole printing press and burn the parliament buildings. Ground Zero, what is now downtown Toronto. People live in Toronto and they have no idea that it was a battleground. There are people buried there. There are bullets and bones under our feet every day. The American tactics in Canada were bloody, brutal, and stupid, and they alienated the local population. The citizens of York fight back. They are now ready to lay down their lives to preserve their independence. Those people would have felt exactly like we would feel today. That kind of fight brings people together, and a kind of an identity is forged out of that what will make a country. It's not just geography, it's not lines on a map. It's a sense of shared identity. It's an imagined community. I think the War of 1812 helped to do that. June, 1813. Queenston, Ontario, 10 kilometers north of Niagara Falls. It's a thriving, densely populated trading hub on the Canadian side of the Niagara River. Home to Laura Secord. With a husband wounded in battle, Laura Secord is left to run their farm, rear their children, and care for him on her own. into the room. I think each and every woman of that generation had tremendous courage. Jeez. What we forget is that women were the glue of the family and the hope for the future. Everything Secord has worked for everything she loves is directly in the path 
of a hostile, invading army that is low on food, shelter, and supplies. They take what they want when they want it. And Laura Secord's home is next. First, 1813. The home of Laura Secord and her family has been seized by American soldiers, including Captain Serenius Chapin. Chapin is the leader of a clandestine American operation. Just a minute. If we raise our swords against the British, Upper Canada will break. I tell you. They will not expect our attack. Chapin wants to cut off and occupy the Niagara Peninsula, a key supply line for British troops. In the next two days, he plans to attack the British camp protecting the peninsula. Laura Secord has a decision to make. Stay by her family's side or risk her life to warn the British at their camp. The camp is 30 kilometers away through American-held territory. Secord knows if she is caught as a spy, she could be shot on sight. I can't imagine what it was like at that time to take that action as a female. The strength, the tenacity, the audacity that she had to do what she did, the confidence. And here we are so many decades later, looking back at a woman who shows that women can do anything. Hour by grueling hour, she avoids American patrols and presses onward. With nightfall coming, Secord is lost. Then, a fateful encounter. A 16-year-old warrior on the lookout for Americans. John Tutela of the Cayuga Nation. Some may think that Laura Secord ran into these guys by chance. I don't think for one minute that they found themselves there by chance. I think those two people were meant to find one another in the woods and to change the course of history. I need to get to the British. Secord entrusts Tutela the with British. her secret. We need to go to them quick. He and his warriors agree to escort her to the British detachment the Americans will soon attack. After an 18-hour trek, they arrive at the British camp. Would she have known that it really was one of the turning points of, of our independence? No, maybe not, but she knew she had to do it. I need to speak to your master pet. Secord reveals the American's plan to British Lieutenant James Fitzgibbon. In Beaver Dams, within hours, maybe 12, 13, I'm not sure. Laura Secord is a hero, and like a lot of heroes, 
who are ordinary people, they say, well, I just did the thing that had to be done. It's what people do every day in small ways. And sometimes those small things have historic implications and historic reverberations. You must act fast. Fitzgibbon plans a counterattack, but he'll need help. With his fellow warriors, Tutela ambushes the Americans five kilometers from the British detachment. Chapin and his men surrender. Through their alliance, John Tutela and Laura Secord help to save the Niagara Peninsula, stopping the American advance into Upper Canada. We were a group of disparate communities and cultures and individuals trying to work together on a mass of land, and we didn't know what we were. We didn't have a national identity. We didn't have a nation. But we knew that with the Americans encroaching, we weren't that. The U.S. military is counting on the British Navy's preoccupation with its war with Napoleon overseas. The Americans believe that Canada will be easily conquered. I think they had the sense they could carry out this war, get Canada fairly easily. All of North America was going to be part of the United States. The British Empire cannot send reinforcements, but they can rely on a new kind of warrior. He's not a naval officer, but a seafaring mercenary, a privateer. Privateers would be anybody that wanted to be part of the fight, make a living, and happen to have some resources that they could use for the fight. Keep a sharp eye! These should be rich waters! Captain Joseph Bars from Nova Scotia, known to Americans as the terror of the New England seaboard. His mission, to kidnap American merchant ships and seize their cargo. What the privateers did was cut off American trade. By doing that, you've undermined the American economy. Privateers cut off the money. Captain Barsa's skill at privateering just might save his country from being conquered by the Americans. On to the next prize! A dangerous new rebel is prowling the eastern seaboard seizing American cargo and threatening its economy. Captain Joseph Bars of Liverpool, Nova Scotia, a veteran privateer. Bars and his crew are on a mission to hunt down American ships, sailing through the waters off Cape Cod. This group of people would not have been embraced by society, would not have been invited in for supper. I'm guessing they were only popular when they were useful. They weren't people that people wanted to marry their daughters, but they changed the course of history. Barsa's schooner is a former high-speed mail ship called the Liverpool Packet. It's light, nimble, and gives him the advantage of surprise. He's soon within a nautical mile of a rich target. an American brig called the Swift. Captained by Benoni Cook, the Swift is heavy with a small fortune in cotton and leather from Savannah, Georgia. The United States had become a very wealthy country and their ships bore the riches of the age. And for privateers, the gains could be very great. Bars flies the stars and stripes to fool his prey an illegal maneuver for military ships. But privateers aren't bound by the laws of the Navy. Put one across our bow! He fires a 12-pounder. A warning to stop or perish. Privateering's a, a dodgy business, and if you run across the wrong ship, of course, it's a fatal business. The Swift is outgunned, its crew in no mood to fight for their cargo. 
Mr. Starling, Mr. Thomas, hold these men in the bow. Mr. Fraser, hoist the colors. Move along. It's important to make the Americans feel that if they go a mile or two miles out of the safety of their ports, everything is left up to chance. It's tradition to place the captured ashore close to their home. Bars grants Benoni and his crew this small mercy. It made the Americans feel vulnerable. It made them feel exposed and it made them feel insecure. And you know, that's really important in war. Bars and his men sail both ships back to Canadian waters. The Swift, along with the rest of the prizes captured by Bars, are worth up to four million of today's dollars. In 10 months, Bars captures 50 vessels, nine schooners in a single day. Canada's most successful privateer. We don't have a, a kind of an archetypal glowing good Canadian against an evil American there. Hey! It's all much, much muddier, and there's a long, long tradition of pirates being legitimated by governments going back to the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Over three years, Canadian privateers capture more than 200 American ships, disrupting American trade routes to Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean helping to expand a shipping industry in Nova Scotia, contributing to the growth of Halifax from a colonial harbor town to one of Canada's busiest port cities. The United States now realizes that Canada will not fall easily. Thomas Jefferson said the acquisition of Canada would be a mere matter of marching, which is exactly what Canadians hate about Americans. Outnumbered 27 to 1, the people of Canada will not surrender. Our forces hold in Windsor, Toronto, Niagara, and all along our Atlantic coast. Frustrated, the U.S. military plans to land the knockout blow. 10,000 troops march on the heart of Lower Canada, Montreal. If the Americans get to Montreal, they cut the St. Lawrence. It isolates the British and the Canadians in Upper Canada. If they take Montreal, they win the war. October 25th, 1813. Captain Joseph Maurice Lamotte of Montreal's 3rd Battalion. A skilled fur trader from the Northwest Company, fluent in several indigenous languages. Lamont leads a multinational force of Abenaki, Algonquin, and Haudenosaunee warriors. Under the cover of night, they use their woodsman skills to scout the American advance. Guerrilla fighters are both psychological, but they're also important militarily because what they do is they hit the enemy where he's most vulnerable. They are the IEDs of the War of 1812. Commanding 1,000 men in the lead U.S. Brigade, Brigadier General George Izzard, a career soldier and son of a U.S. Senator. With the eyes of his nation upon him, Izard's mission is to seize Montreal and bring this unpopular war to a close. And now, his forces are closing in. October 25th, 1813, near what is now Chateauguay, Quebec. In a final push to win the war, 4,000 American troops march north to Montreal. Captain Joseph Maurice Lamotte returns to base camp to report the Americans' position to his commander. 
Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salaberry, a French-Canadian and soldier since the age of 14. De Salaberry knows, with only 1,500 troops at his command, this battle will not be won with firepower. They were clearly outnumbered, so that's terrifying to even walk into something like that, knowing that you're the underdog. And that actually really creates such a unified team. Vous et vos hommes allez prendre la crête. Nous serons ici. Ouais. Aujourd'hui, on verra de quel bois on se chauffe. De Salaberry assembles a team of indigenous warriors, French Canadian militia, and escaped slaves from the U.S. A diverse fraternity with a common cause. The idea of African Canadians. Scots, you know, all these Aboriginals, all these people that are now identifying themselves as Canadian and they are fighting the Americans was, was crucial. Must have been a very, very powerful experience indeed. I really think the Canadian identity is multiple identities. We were, we were founded literally on so many different people coming together and I don't think that's changed. I think we are still cultivating that. To defend themselves, this diverse force makes a weapon of the very thing which unites them, intimate knowledge of their homeland. Even with all the technology that we have, to use the landscape in your advantage is a military tactics that will win the war. Izar and his American force follow the Shadowgay River north. But now the river narrows into a ravine flanked on both sides by steep slopes and dense Canadian forest. It's the perfect stage for an ambush. De Salaberry's men construct a massive abati, the early ancestor of barbed wire. The one that's gonna be able to use the ground best will be the one that will win. By early afternoon, 300 French Canadian sharpshooters are positioned at the crest of the ravine. Izar and his thousand troops march into view. The battle is on. Under fire from two sides, Izart orders his troops to keep advancing. Their numbers and their resolve overwhelm the Salaberry's men. For every soldier shot, a dozen move forward. Feeling the tide turn against him, the Salaberry improvises with a daring move. He calls in his bugler a black soldier from America, now fighting for Canada. In their minds, this is my country, and you're trying to invade my country. I'm gonna do everything I can to help repel the oppressors. They had a real stake in, in this fight. You know, they knew that if they lost this war, the only option for them was to go back to slavery. In Canada, they found uh, a country that hadn't quite formed yet, but um, that was willing to accept them where they could have a life. Buglers sound their battle calls, signaling the arrival of oncoming Canadian troops. Troops that do not exist. Now, Izzard is the one who feels outnumbered. Unity of effort will bring people together. And I think this is what forged Canada since our genesis. Pull back! Pull back! And I think this is what we are as Canadians, to be able to use the strength of our differences and to be able to make them, make them come together for one purpose.
Izzard's men retreat south of the border and never return. Although it is known today as the War of 1812, the U.S. war against Britain in Canada lasts nearly three years, until February 18, 1815. By war's end, 48,000 people have gone to battle for Canada, 10,000 of them indigenous. Over 2,000 people die in action, thousands more from disease. All of these men and women fight for a common cause, the identity of an emerging nation. There were so many different people who came here at different times, but when a threat comes in to take the very thing that you've built, and you all band together to fight for the same thing, essentially, I mean, that's where you've created the country. War of 1812 was very much Canada's War of Independence because it defined Canada, it defined Canadians, it made it very clear that we were not Americans and we were never going to be. For nearly three years, the outnumbered Canadians beat back wave after wave of American invasions, denying their neighbors' dream of controlling the continent. Within a single generation, Canada will no longer be a colony, but a sovereign nation. But together, we'll need to connect over 5,000 kilometers of landmass from coast to coast.